You're listening to a Count Out Podcast. What's up and welcome everyone to Okada Shorts G Wondering. This is going to be a short, short episode breaking down the first night of G1 Climax 32. I am your bad friend, Rafe Hewson. Unfortunately, I am not joined by the one and only Curtis Spears, the other half of the Kings of Pod style and the other half of the International Wrestling Grand Prix. That is right, we are trading out night by night on the G1 Climax in order to get you as many episodes as we can just with our instant takes of the G1 Climax heat. So we won't be breaking down the tags leading up to it, we're just going to be getting in there and telling you our instant thoughts. Now to set the stage for you, I'll tell you this much, I'm sitting on a chair in rainy Perth, Western Australia, windows are open, looking out over the city. I'm staring into my wardrobe cupboard with a hot cup of coffee in a cute Pikachu mug. My beautiful wife Amy is asleep in the other room, so I'm going to do my best to not wake her up with my excitement, but crank out another fun episode for you. The stakes are as follows. We have a Pickums contest between several of us. Uh, there is myself, there is Curtis, my co-host from Okada Shorts. There is Travis, uh, who's actually the reigning G-Wandering champion from my original season and good friend. Uh, there is my wife, Amy, and our good friend, Momo, the architect of the crazy Excel spreadsheet I'm looking at in front of you. But without getting too further ahead, I can tell you the following. Uh, for the matches for last night, I had picked the following. It was going to be Tanahashi losing to Hanare, Osprey beating El Fantasmo, Sonata losing to Jay White, and then Okada beating Jeff Cobb. Now, I wasn't sure how this was going to play out, um, but I ended up going a clean sweep. So, breaking down those matches for you, um, I was really feeling like Hanare was going to have a big signature win here. He's been such a long time with the company, such a hard-working guy, and I was really hoping for like one big win to sort of set him out and make him a threat for the tournament. I'm not, I mean, I would love it if they made him a force and, you know, had him pick up some huge wins throughout this tournament. I'm not sure that's going to happen just yet, but a couple of signature wins would be really nice for him. This one and his history with Tanahashi makes this the most important. Uh, and then if we can get another, you know, signature win. Or two would be amazing, but that would be really great for the tournament. Um, I love this match, man. I actually caught, like, the start of it while driving home. <laughs> Not very safe. Had it on in my center console, basically, but I was kind of catching it, and then as I pulled into my car park and stuff, I was able to see the finish. Um, it was it, it was a great, hard-hitting match. Tanahashi can tell a story like nobody else, and I feel like Hanare really showed out in his... Uh, press conference he was talking about how he's the biggest guy in the block and he plans to you know use that physicality and size to take wins and punish his opponents and he did that and I I like the full Nelson finisher as well um you know that's a a tried and true old school wrestling finisher and with all the size he's put on they they sell it like it's it's really destructive and that it can you know injure opponents and and that was really enjoyable and there was just some, some huge hard hitting moments, and there was a spine buster that was literally chaotic. Um, there was some great big, uh, big moves like the uh, aces high and high fly flow onto the knees, and it really just told that story of you know 
an R8 over coming through, you know, physical brutality, basically. Um, I loved the match. I loved it for Hanare, and and the ace just proves why he's one of the best in the company because he can make stars out of anybody, you know. Uh, I thought it was a great kickoff to the G1 Climax and made me really excited for how the tournament's going to play out. Um, next up was Osprey versus El Fantasmo. Man, and El Fantasmo fits in this heavyweight division like nobody's business. I was actually... Uh, you know, when juniors come up from heavyweights, I'm kind of thinking, oh, he might look physically smaller. But I, I thought he looked about the same size as Osprey, to be truthful. You know, seeing them straight ahead from each other. So I don't think he looked out of place at all. Um, and I think he looked like a star. Um, in th- this match, they were pulling out literally all the stops. So many crazy parts. But you can't... I mean, the rest of it all fades away when you think about that hidden blade at the end. Like... I don't think I've seen the hidden blade from the front before, like to the face, basically. Uh, and it just looked like an utter fatality. It was so brutal. The sound was so loud. And, you know, it it really was a, a full stop on the match. Like the moment you hit it, you knew it was over. But, yeah, those two were really great together. Um, and, yeah, it showed. I, I love this match as well. Uh, and we're already setting like a huge pace for the G1 Climax. Osprey picks up the win, uh, as I'd expect from the, you know, United States champion and RevPro champion when versing uh, a junior's first match in the heavyweight division. But but I was like, the entire time through the match, I was just like shades of what ELP's going to be as he develops, as he uh, improves and stuff. He's so good. He's so good. You know, we, we talked about the press conference on the last episode of Okada Shorts, uh, how he essentially won <laughs> the press conference just with a text message. Um, I think he's got a huge personality. I think he's incredibly naturally funny. Um, and that just, like, leads into a winning combination when you add his physical prowess. And he was definitely given... You, you know, you don't want to say other wrestler vibes, like as an insult, I mean, as a compliment, like there was definite Kenny Omega vibes in this. Um, but I think in, in a way that Kenny's kind of humour is sort of weird and sort of a little bit goofy and stuff, like I think ELP is way more naturally sort of funny and cooler, I guess, than Kenny. And so I, th- I think the ceiling for him could be really, really high. Um, Sonata versus Jay White. Uh, I was expecting a bit more of a look change from Sonata, but he didn't. He, I mean, he's kind of got back that weird whale hunter's beard and, and hair kind of look again, so I don't think he's doing his best work right now. Um, I was expecting this match to be slower. Um, you know, certain opponents can get more out of Sonata than others. Uh, and, I mean, this was Jay White, you know, turned up to 11, really kind of pushing that, you know, he's the, the heel and Sonata's the face and, you know, everybody should cheer for Sonata and, and all this kind of stuff. But they did a great job making Sonata feel like a threat towards the end. You know, at first Jay's super dominant and super cocky and then Sonata starts to pick up steam and then you actually start to feel like Sonata can win. Um, as I laid out my my predictions, and I, I kind of feel feel like maybe I felt, fucking overbooked my t- my pickums like to the gills I was still <laughs> like right up until the last thing I was reshuffling things but I ended up going with Sonata to win this block after watching that match I'm not convinced that was maybe the right choice but New Japan love Sonata they love putting him in big spots and you know they're, they're grooming him towards great things and, and he does have a high ceiling once he gets there um, and I had been like towards as he won the uh, US title, I was I was feeling like we might be seeing a, a change in him there. And there was definitely better shades of that, but he's still got a way to go. Um, so we'll see how that works out. But, yeah, Jay picks up the win, uh, which I was very happy about, and leading me to three of three. Um, yeah, and Jay's just so good. He's so obnoxious. He's going to be so dominant in this tournament. I think I've only got him with two losses, and even now I feel like that was a mistake. I feel like maybe he's going to go, you know, the whole way and 
not even get a loss until the the semis. But we'll see how it goes. I mean, it's New Japan. Anybody can lose to anybody at any time, which is what makes this so fun. The tipping was so hard, like, uh, you know, picking who was going to be and trying to essentially write stories uh, as I laid this all out and, you know, what I thought everyone was going to be. Uh, speaking of writing stories, um, the Monster Hunter story that is Okada's in his monster block got off to a fresh start. A lot of people were thinking, you know, Jeff Cobb was going to get his win back from G1 last year. Uh, he came out, I, I started to notice, or well, my wife noticed and pointed out, she's like, hey, Jeff Cobb, Will Ospreay, Hanare, they were all in like the same gear. So, you know, they're United Empire, but they've changed over to like a silver and black theme. And she's like, maybe he is going to win. And, you know, then they come out and it's like all the United Empire guys won sort of thing. Like a big roll call with the three of them there looking like a really dominant faction. I was like, oh, no. I'm like, I hope that doesn't fucking happen. But then Okada comes out in his new robe in red and I'm like, oh, bitch, don't you worry about this. And then he uh, reveals it and he's got that new golden red gear and I'm like, Okada ain't losing a fucking nobody. I mean, I said that. <laughs> I actually said that the in the Tokyo Dome when Okada went away from the pants, when he tore away the kilt and had the shorts. I believe I screamed, you're fucked now, Jay White, from the third row. And then he lost that. But I... I felt pretty confident that he was looking real good and I felt like the story of this block is Okada overcoming everybody. Whether he can do that by the end, whether, like, you know, he, he picks up a ton of wins at the start and then starts to fall to the bigger guys towards the end, I'm not sure. Um, but, but this match was awesome, dude. Jeff Cobb and Okada are so good together and I didn't know up until the last second. Once he deadlifted Jeff Cobb, into that Emerald Flosion, it was a, a wrap. Like, what a what a finishing stretch. It was killer. In his um, post-match comments, it was really interesting too because he, he was essentially kind of saying, and, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but, like, the hardest part about being a champion and wrestling in tournaments and, you know, operating at a high level is, like, self-belief, really. Like, when you're in the deep water, when you're you know, taking that much punishment, believing in yourself that you can come through it, that you can weather it and you can still get the win. Uh, and I thought that was a, you know, perfect kind of comment from him. He's a, a veteran of these tournaments. He's won these tournaments. He's a long-time champion. And that's like words of the wise for for everybody. And yeah, I'm, so I went four straight wins. Uh, Curtis had two wins. Uh, he had picked. Let's go. Let's go through everybody standing. So, I went four straight. Curtis got two wins. Uh, he picked Hanare to win, and he picked Jay White to win. Uh, Travis went one win in that he picked Jay White to win. Uh, Amy also had four straight, and then Mo uh, had picked Tanahashi over Hanare. Shame on you, Mo. Uh, and then the last three. Uh, were correct. Uh, so, yeah, we, we're going to be off to a, a tight contest. Everybody's got some very different picks. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see who can pull out the, the victory at the end. Let's quickly preview next week for you. We've got... Do, do, do. Okay, next week's heats are going to be Ishii versus Tai Chi, and I've picked Tai Chi. Uh, Yano versus Jonah. And I've picked Jonah. I'm nervous about that because uh, Yano is always a wild card, but I feel like it's Jonah's first uh, appearance in New Japan proper in the G1. I feel like they're going to want to make him a monster. Um, ZSJ versus Kenta. I've picked Kenta here, which is surprising for me. Really thought I'd pick Zach. So that may come back to haunt me, but I've picked Kenta. He is returning after all um, from a pretty big injury. Uh, and then Shingo versus Juice. And I have nervously chosen Shingo. Um, I think that's the right choice, though. Juice is also returning from injury. He's uh, carrying the US title. He's not the actual champion, but he has the title. And I feel like he's going to be pretty dominant, pretty scummy, um, fake champion until Osprey sort of shuts him up towards the end. So, yeah, I'm really excited to see where it goes. 
Um, I'm very excited for this tournament, and I can't wait to hear Curtis's take on night two. So, guys, make sure you check us out on social media at Okada Shorts. Check me out at Faces Feels Cast. You can check out Curtis at El Destructo 83. Uh, we've got link trees up in our bios for everything that you need to find for Okada Shorts. And, yeah, come on the ride that is G-Wondering as we slowly descend into madness, podcasting for every single night of the G1 Climax 32. I want to thank you guys for your time. This was a nice, chill episode to run it all down. And remember to rate and subscribe, listen or die, keep it right, keep it tight, and most importantly, keep it short. This has been a Count Out Podcast. Hi guys, this is Lauren, your proud host of Your Dose of Death. Just give me a little quick tune in to make sure to listen to Your Dose of Death. Each and every single episode, I provide a different lens into the world of deathmatch, whether it be wrestlers, content creators, or anyone in between. Make sure to listen to me each and every single episode to get a different lens into the death. And please, make sure to listen to your dose of death.